Hi everyone, I'm very, very sorry for all the technical problems we've had this morning. Um, we, this has never happened to us before, so I do apologise. Um, hopefully everybody that was on YouTube will be able to join us uh, in the Zoom room over the next few minutes. We're going to start from the beginning again, uh, just because we're recording this and we want to have a complete recording to be able to share with people that uh, can't make it today. So I'm sorry if you've already heard this before and I will go through it as quickly as I can. So as I say, welcome to the Modernising Energy Data Applications Briefing event. My name is Jenny McDonald from the KTN and I'm hosting this event on behalf of the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, prospering from the energy revolution, ably assisted by my colleagues, Stefan Eldred and Natasha Sim. Before we get started with today's presentations, I'd just like to take you through some housekeeping. So first of all, the first bullet point uh, is still valid, even though we're in Zoom. Um, if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box, which you will see in the menu at the bottom of your window. Don't put them in the chat box. Please put them in the Q&A box so that we know that they're questions that need to be put to our speakers. Uh, as you did in YouTube, please feel free to introduce yourselves through the chat box. That's for the chatter rather than the questions. Uh, and we are recording this uh, Zoom meeting now uh, and the link will be sent to you after the event, along with a link to today's presentations so that you can share them with colleagues that weren't able to join us this morning. We will still be running our one-to-one -one discussions with Bayes, Ofgem and Innovate UK. This is an opportunity to have a 10 minute meeting with them after today's event, this afternoon between two and three o'clock to share your project idea or ask any questions that you might have about the competition in confidence with the funders. If you haven't already, you can register at the link that was sent to you last week for the Meeting Mojo platform um, and book a meeting with them there. And I'll take you through that at the break. So moving on to today's agenda, we have a, a very tight agenda now. Um, first of all, David um, will be taking you through a short introduction to Prospering from the Energy Revolution, which is the IFCF programme that's funding today's competition. We will then hear from Bayes, Ofgem and Olev, who will talk about some of the policies and regulations that are driving this opportunity and where you can help. Um, we then have a presentation by um, Gavin Starks from Icebreaker One and Andrew Smythe from Siemens. They were two of the winners for the uh, uh, earlier competition, Modernising Energy Data Access, um, which is developing a national platform to make it easier to access all the different types of energy data that's generated by the sector. What you develop with this competition in terms of applications will need to be compatible with that platform as you'll be using that data. We then have a presentation from Regen and Energy Systems Catapult. Uh, Tamar Bourne from Regen and Richard Halsey from the Energy Systems Catapult will be talking through some of their findings from a recent investigation they did, talking to consumers and organizations about their energy challenges in their local area. And they've developed some priority use cases um, that might help you to design your uh, real world uh, need app uh, for this competition. So we're hoping that all of those presentations will set the scene and help you to understand what we're looking for a little better. We then have a short networking break where you'll be able to book your one-to-one -one meetings with our funders followed by the main presentation of the day, Competition Scope. And David Richardson will take you through exactly what it is we're looking for. And Carl Wilkins will take you through the rules and eligibility and how to apply through our IFS system for this competition. We'll then have our Q&A. So having put all of your questions into the Q&A box on the Zoom window, uh, I will put those questions to our speakers and you will hear, hear their answers live today. Finally, I'll give a very short presentation on how the KTM can help you with this competition in terms of finding partners and uh, helping you with your application before we close. And now, unfortunately, it will be a little bit later than planned uh, around uh, 20 past one. 
And then, as I say, we will then move to the Meeting Mojo platform if you've booked a one-to-one -one discussion with Bayes, Ofgem or Innovate UK, and they start at two o'clock. So it should all still work despite the delay in starting today's event. So now I would like to hand over to our first presenter, David Richardson from Innovate UK to explain prospering from the energy revolution. Thank you, David. Hi everyone, um, thank you for being patient with us. We'll uh, have a look into it and ensure that we don't have technical issues with any future competition briefing events. Um, I'm gonna kind of rattle through this a little quicker than I would normally to try and make up time. My name is David Richardson. I'm innovation lead for energy systems at Innovate UK, delivering components of the prospering from the energy revolution and other parts of our data work. And I'm gonna be laying out the the strategic context in which this competition fits before handing over to colleagues from Bayes off German OLEV to talk about their portfolios of work and how they work together. So skipping on. So Prospering from the Energy Revolution is one of the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund programs, uh, which has been running for a little over two and a half years now. It's a five year program. And this is the, the general components of it. It's really looking at how we integrate energy provision in our local areas of the UK so that we provide heat, power and transport using new business models and market structures, really looking at how the business models to deliver um, decarbonized energy systems at scale can be constructed rather than the technology components which are reaching maturity in their own right at the moment. So a kind of landmark area of the, the program is for large-scale demonstrator projects on the scale of cities and regions across the UK and uh, 10 future design projects which take spend in two years to really analyze the needs of local energy systems across the uk and then developing new approaches to to really roll them out at scale and achieve our net zero ambitions whilst creating business opportunities within those local areas as well i'll post a link to some of the projects in that portfolio in both of those portfolios if you'd like to look in more detail so I'll do that in the chat once I'm, I'm finished speaking here. This competition falls into the pot on the right which is called the Innovation Accelerator and that portfolio of funding has really been around the technology components that we still think need to be developed further to really enable these integrated local energy systems across the UK. So we funded a number of fast start projects about two years ago and we've got a portfolio of what we term key technology components which range from controls for heat networks to um, data services that interact for, on electric vehicle forecourts those sorts of things and below that we have the modernizing energy data work stream so moving on so another program of work which we've been delivering with Ofgem and the Department for Business Energy and Industrial Strategy is called the Modernizing Energy Data Program. And this slide is really illustrating the interfaces between prospering from the energy revolution and this wider program of work to really accelerate the digitalization and availability of data within the energy system. So prospering from the energy revolution is really the innovation banner, but alongside this, there's a lot of policy and regulatory work to really unlock some of the barriers to enabling better data provision for the energy sector. 
and collaboratively we um, we asked Energy Systems Catapults a couple of years ago to deliver something called the Energy Data Task Force which has been really impactful and um, gave some really high quality recommendations to government about how we can improve this data strategy for the UK energy sector. So I'm not going to go into detail about the blue boxes, which really fall into Dinker and Stevens camp at Bayes and Ofgem. But on the top row, we, we ran a competition called Modernising Energy Data Access last year. And that was really looking at how we build a common data architecture for the energy sector, which enables good governance of data, sets rules and standards, enables interoperability, ingestion from different sources and availability of data, um, both from kind of a rules perspective, but also from the software platforms that will enable that. And then following that, we've run a project with Regen, who are gonna speak shortly, on local energy data innovation. And really that's focused on how do we start eliciting the user needs within our local energy systems that can be built against to solve real world problems using data solutions. So you'll get more information on that. The Modernizing Energy Data Applications competition, which is what we're launching today, is now looking to utilize that data architecture, the, um, the transparency of those user needs and challenges that we have across the UK to develop new data applications, which will really supercharge the digitalization of our energy system. So that's the context for the moment. And we're looking at how our future programs of work can really build upon this and, and grow this area of the sector. So as I said, the Modernizing Energy Data Access competition, that's already run. And there's two winning projects still in flight from Siemens and Icebreaker One, who we'll talk to you shortly. And now today we're launching the Modernizing Energy Data Applications. I'm gonna talk more on the scope of this later, but briefly we're making available two million pounds in funding over two phases to develop a number of really sector leading applications and prove that the new data architecture that's being developed will help the integration of data sources, not just from the energy sector, but across different sectors. We really believe that to achieve um, a low cost decarbonization of our local energy systems, we need to start thinking across sectors and the data interactions between areas such as telecoms, social sciences, um, water and other infrastructure areas. So that side is what we're talking to you about today, the modernizing energy data applications or MEDAPs. I'll hand over to Dinka. Yeah, hi, good morning everyone. Uh, thanks David and thanks to everyone for porting over to Zoom uh, quickly. Uh, so as David sort of explained that this is a comprehensive piece of work that we're doing, the ambition is to um, make data open in the energy sector, make it available to innovators in the right formats and the right standards so that once you know that data exists, you can make use of it. And the Meta and the MedApps work is essentially proving what we can do once data is made available or the sort of use cases that we can service through creative applications of, of this data. But innovation requires policy and regulatory clarity. Uh, and unless you have that, you can have a great idea, but then you, can prob you will probably struggle to scale it up. So recognizing that, the work that I'm leading with um, in base and working really closely with Stephen, uh, who you will hear from, is about making that policy and regulatory frameworks as clear as possible so that innovators like yourselves and also incumbents have the confidence and the clarity with which they can then build applications or build or, or make their ideas uh, into reality. So uh, there's a lot of detail at the at the link on this on this uh, slide, and you will hear more from others. But at a very high level, this is a collaborative program, and the principles that we abide by when doing is that we want to be as open and collaborative as possible. Uh, we want to be outcome oriented because this is not about just digitalizing without any you know, ambition in mind or end, end use case in mind. So it's all about outcomes. 
and we want to be as strategic as possible because we recognize that data does not fit within the neat boundaries of you know organizations or energy system uh, we are looking at net zero obviously uh, energy is now hugely integrated with transport with heat with lands and buildings so really just trying to look at a very small part of the ecosystem would not be the best approach so we want to be as strategic as possible but we also want to describe what we mean by digitalization and and those descriptors there are essentially our attempt at describing what we mean by digitalization so we want a culture of presumed open that is quite crucial we want that that uh, all data custodians should look at their data and see can i make this available for the benefit of the system and then obviously you need to have the right incentives and the right frameworks to enable people to do that it also has to be of the right quality and quantity so that you know uh, applications can be built on top of them and then we also need to invest in the required infrastructure because oftentimes uh, there is a lack of common infrastructure that is needed to enable at scale deployment of innovation and our hope is that meda and medaps are actually catalysts that enable that national infrastructure to to be built and then like i said you need to have the right incentives you need to have the right regulatory frameworks and that's the work that we're progressing with with ofgem on making it clear to uh, incumbents and innovators of what we expect the energy industry to be doing with regards to data and digitalization so that's sort of the high level uh, view of of what we really care about if we, if we can move to the next slide or can i do that yeah uh, sorry one back so can we go one back brilliant uh, so hopefully i described to you the the overall policy context and uh, the energy data task force report was a key catalyst for the work in this work in this area but the report was published in june of last year and it's been a while right so um we are now working with ofgem and and others to make sure that we implement on those recommendations in the report but also do something that's a lot more comprehensive and uh, durable because just delivering those five recommendations is is a is a big step in the right direction but it's not the whole picture and that's why we believe that um making sure that we have a strategic approach that sort of leads us to the eventual outcomes is something that we should focus on and hopefully we'll have lots more to share with you very soon but i think at a high level all our activities we feel are neatly organized under these three strategic pillars of either the work that we do provides clear leadership to the sector in terms of what is expected and gives them guidance on how they can go about doing it or it supports the development of some sort of building blocks and i believe the work today that innovate uk is doing through the modernizing energy data access and applications is actually building is creating those building blocks which are really crucial and important and then we need to have the right incentives and frameworks that allow people to innovate uh, give them confidence when dealing with data uh, provide the you know the right regulatory and license structures that allow people to share data with confidence and we need to give that guidance as well um, through hard and soft regulatory measures and that's a lot of the work that that ofgem are doing and leading on so i will I will leave this slide on for Stephen to come on, and he will give you a bit more flavor of what Ofgem are doing in terms of making clear what those frameworks can look like. So, with that, over to Stephen. Lovely, thank you, Dinka. Um, yeah, I will begin by uh, reiterating the message that I hope you've heard uh, loud and clear from from David and from Dinka, which is that Ofgem innovate and uh, Bayes are all working very much together on this theme. We think that's really important to get the right outcomes that we're all looking for uh, with obviously things like net zero, uh, but also improving uh, the GB UK infrastructure uh, and the digital economy and these things all being at the, the heart of what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, the, the overall modernizing energy data work spans many things across technology, um, governance uh, and here you can see today about uh, seeding and enabling innovation uh, but let's talk about that theme more I, I think what we're trying to arrive at is a picture where you don't need permission to innovate which is probably 
uh, more the world we're coming from, where there are a lot of challenges and blockers to people's ideas being brought to market, being brought to consumers. Uh, we want to make sure that as we modernize and evolve the energy system and its place among all the other systems around it, uh, that we make sure that ideas can be brought to the fore. Uh, that takes a strategic uh, level of work. It takes work that crosses many different areas. Um, and so here you have today a competition to make sure that there is the space and ability and the guidance to help make, bring your ideas to the fore. Uh, but around that, there is a lot of support as well. And, and if you wouldn't mind just passing along the slide, uh, I'll show you all what I, I suspect may win the award for the driest slide uh, of the day. It's, uh, but it is a, it's here for signposting for you, the, to give you uh, some clarity over the current state and the direction of travel of the regulatory rules on energy and data uh, that will be very important uh, to this innovation competition and the other competitions that we've uh, talked about around it. So a brief update on what Ofgem is doing on data and digitalization. Uh, you will see that there's been a strong starting focus on the network companies that we regulate, uh, and that's taken two different forms. We're making sure that those uh, monopolistic uh, organizations that are very heavily regulated because of the nature of the work that they do, we're making sure that as much as possible, uh, the data uh, that they uh, inevitably produce through doing uh, it has a maximum responsible availability. That's the, the presumed open angle that you'll have seen in the Energy Data Task Force. There, there are two principal ways that we're accomplishing that and a number of other things. One of them is requiring those companies to comply with what we call data best practice. And that's a set of uh, principles which bring together ex uh, as much as possible existing practices with data, whether that be from the ICO on uh, in privacy or from the NCSC on security. Or, uh, and other recognized standards for how uh, you make sure that data is in effective formats, it's a low burden to work with, it's easy to exchange it between organizations. So it's providing sort of the, the, the regulatory governance framework uh, that puts uh, consumers at the heart of what data is there for and used for. And that should go a long way to making sure that as innovations such as those that I'm sure will come forward through this work, uh, have the right tools and starting points available to them so that you can gain access to the information that you need to bring your ideas to, to, to reality. Uh, as well as that, we've also been doing work on digitalization strategies, or rather asking the companies that we regulate to make their digitalization strategies uh, available and publicly uh, accessible and easy to engage with and to influence and evolve. Uh, the idea here is that there are a certain set of uh, quite monopolistic data and digital services that the energy market uh, needs to make available so that markets can sit on top of those core functions from the energy system. Uh, and we want to make sure that those monopolistic services are progressing on the medium and long term, the right kinds of services that people such as yourselves need to be able to take advantage of information uh, that's produced by the core of the energy system and also to make sure that our energy system, its infrastructure, uh, interoperates effectively uh, with all of the other uh, markets around us as well. Uh, so that's uh, what we have on the page here is uh, effectively a couple of groups of information. Some is those, those central sets of guidance of where we're establishing our views on data best practice and what good uh, digitalization strategies look like. And then you can also see in the second box the, the, the early areas where we've been working on embedding these into actual regulation right now we are in the midst of consulting over the design of the new Rio frameworks of embedding those expectations into formal regulation. Uh, so that I hope gives you a uh, clarity on some of the direction of travel, that this isn't just stuff that we're talking about, but it's work that is actively being consulted over being turned into regular uh, regulatory operations. Uh, at the bottom is just a pointer to the, the main Ofgem homepage where we'll post any sort of future updates. But I, I hope that this work is useful and effective guidance and assurance so that as you come forward with your innovation ideas for this competition that you know that you've got uh, the regulatory wins in support uh, of exactly this kind of work. Uh, so with that I think I'll hand over to Sophie, you're next I think. Brilliant, thank you. So hi, my name is Sophie Adams and I'm the Head of Consumer Experience in OLEV. Um, so I'm 
unfortunately I can't move the slides so if we can go on to the next one I am presenting um, a more of a use case so asking the question of how can we align the work that we're doing in the EV sector with the modernizing energy data program of work so my core focus is the public charging infrastructure we want a seamless experience for consumers who want to charge their EV and data is key to understanding the network the consumer and actually enabling innovation in the sector and I want to start off saying that we want public charging data to be open and available um, but we need to clearly demonstrate how we do this and I'm not talking about consumer data this is focused more on the data about the charge point assets so moving on to the next slide um, we we need to decarbonize the UK and transport makes up a huge chunk of our carbon emissions so this is around like 20 percent of uh, gas emissions and the world has continued to change since this report came out, came out in 2018. And we're not thinking about the EV sector, as I mentioned, in isolation, but we're thinking about how, how it's an extension of the energy sector. And we're thinking about issues such as air quality and other health impacts, which have been actually rising up the agenda. So looking at where we are now, um, and on to the next slide, apologies for this. The public charging network has grown rapidly and in like from 2010 there were no public uh, charging devices but as of April 2020 there are nearly 18,000 including about 3,000 rapid chargers and this is essential to helping us hit mass market um, to encouraging the EV uptake and to um, in, in enabling us to meet our uh, net zero targets. So the net on the next side. So the reason why this is perfect time to happen now, we are holding a consultation um, in autumn 2020. So it's going to be late autumn 2020 and data is a key part of this. So I've, I've put on here sort of some of the other elements that we're looking to consult in. Um, but actually it's how do we ensure that data is open, available? Um, how do we encourage that increased products competition is, um, happens in this sector? And how do we ensure that governments, local authorities can make informed investment decisions? So again, this is it's not just purely about opening data, it's how do we encourage this work um, to, uh, to be extended across the sector? So I'm going to whistle through these slides in the interest of time. Um, so on the next slide, there are so many opportunities for open data. We're looking at two different sides. So we've got static data and dynamic data. And I mean static data is information about the charge point asset itself. So the location, uh, sort of how many uh, cables there are, the expected voltage. And then the dynamic data is the charge point working, is it not? But we have so many different opportunities for releasing this data. And we need, to, uh, we need industry to help us give us use cases. So you guys help us give us use cases and identify the opportunities for aligning this work. Um, but it, again, coming back to it, it's not just about developing the greater consumer experience, but supporting the uptake to mass market as soon as we can. It's all about inter interoperability and ensuring that it's a seamless across EVs to the energy sector. We don't actually hold any of this data in OLEV, but we will be really happy with this competition to engage with the winners and support industry engagement. So we really want to be proactive in this space. We want to reuse any infrastructure that's been developed. So aligning with this work um, and not building any, potentially not building anything else, um, but ensuring that innovation um, it can it can can happen across these sectors um so that's kind of that's a very whistle stop tour from me if you also have any other questions um i've dropped in the email address on the next slide um but thank you thank you very much sophie and to stephen and dinka as well so now we'd li i'd like to move on to uh gavin starts from icebreaker one who's going to tell us a little bit about previous competition modernizing energy data access and how his company is helping to create our national platform gavin good morning uh, and thank you it's really uh, fantastic to be here this is you know one of the most exciting projects i've worked on um, what we're doing with icebreaker one is working on a project called open energy uh, and this is really about building some open standards to enable this open marketplace for the sharing of, of energy data across the market. And that, from that perspective, we're looking at both 
what we call open data, which is data that can be used by anyone for any purpose for free, and shared data, which is more aligned uh, with the either preemptively licensed data or presumed open uh, in trying to open up things like smart meter data or uh, data flows across uh, assets and so on. Here we're trying to build on existing work. So there's an existing program uh, called Open Banking, uh, which many of you may be discovering uh, that you're using on your mobiles and so on, that in has enabled interoperability across the entire banking system in the UK. And the success of that over the last few years has led to the development of an app store. Uh, and this is you know, very much what we're trying to build on the learnings. What can we take over from that, particularly looking at things like data rights, uh, looking at uh, liability transfer as you take data from one place to another, uh, looking at consent and consent management and security and privacy issues here that really help uh, people become comfortable and build that sort of trust uh, across uh, the data landscape. And I think very aligned with uh, what uh, Dinker uh, and Stephen were saying, how do we enable discovery of what's out there and how do we enable it to be used? There are almost two different categories there. Um, and if we, if we go to the next slide, uh, looking at the number of different uh, use cases here, what we're really keen to hear from people uh, through this call is what are your applications? We're very we're going to be very driven by the user needs here. What are the market needs? Where do you see the blockers? Where do you see the opportunities? There's huge potential, you know, whether flexibility markets, uh, whether it's looking at just balancing the existing uh, electricity system, there's a huge potential there, but the landscape uh, itself is very com complex. So if you go to the next slide, uh, we've mapped out over 9,000 companies in the ecosystem. And so try the, the idea of how do we get everybody to start sharing information across this whole net network really requires us to think differently. And this is why we talk more about uh, a culture shift here towards uh, uh, open access to shared data. Uh, we come to the next slide. I'm going to rattle through these pretty quickly because we're running a bit behind schedule. Uh, so looking at the, the future of energy balancing, for example, taking out the uh, building's energy uh, data or, or vehicles uh, and so on. There are millions of assets. You've got a complex uh, provisioning uh, group. You've got GDPR issues that are going to come into play. You've got a whole range of uh, different things. Again, when you then, then look at how are we going to balance all of this, there are going to be millions of data connections and thousands of connected organizations and thousands uh, are, are at both the DSO level and at the ESO level uh, as the uh, micro generation and so on uh, increases. Next slide. Uh, so really we're focused here on helping this culture change. I think it's a really good analogy that Stephen uh, used in one of our recent calls, uh, which was we, we created the entire energy system over the last century and a bit. Uh, and that was sort of pre-digital. Now we've got a digital ecosystem to deal with. We kind of need to rebuild that uh, with digital at the core. And how do we get that data transfer? And one of the biggest navigations, I think one of my learnings here from helping develop the open banking standard and running the Open Data Institute is companies are very nervous about sharing information. So building that trust framework, building that uh, ability for us to connect across silos is going to be uh, really critical. Uh, if you just skip to the, ne to the next uh, two slides, actually so skip to the next one, uh, uh, next one after this. Um, so what we're really keen uh, to do is come to the kind of call to action here. At the heart of what we're doing is we're going to have a minimum viable proposition here for an equivalent of open banking for the energy sector. At the heart of that, there's a directory platform which enables organizations to connect with each other. Uh, through that, there's a huge amount of uh, existing work and prior work that uh, we can build on re regarding uh, APIs and uh, ontologies and so on that describe the data. But what we really need to understand here are what are the, the business rules and business opportunities so that we can join together the organizations and create this preemptive licensing or presumed open framework where people have permission to play. And, and the, the, this is enabling data sharing within a trusted framework um, rather than the kind of friction that currently exists in the system. What we're currently 
uh, spinning up uh, at the moment uh, a range of uh, advisory groups. We've got an advisory group on uh, user needs, market needs, societal needs, one on policy, regulation, and legal issues, one on the operational requirements, and one on the technical requirements. So we're really trying to, again, here, look at what is, what, what's the whole market solution for data sharing, uh, and whether that's at the you know, asset level, or whether it's the edge, uh, or whether it's uh, the, the end user, really trying to understand those needs and those opportunities. Uh, so please uh, get in touch with us. I've put my email address up there. I'll post it in the chat as well and have a look on our website. And we look forward to talking with you very soon. And over to Andrew. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, so my name is Andrew Smythe, and I'm here on behalf of the Siemens Smart Infrastructure and Digital Grid organizations here in the UK. Um, Today, we're just going to talk you briefly around our application within the modernized energy data call, uh, the, the, um, the, the alpha stage, the second stage in the competition, um, uh, in what is an initiative we've called Your Online Digital Architecture. Uh, this is an initiative led by Siemens with, uh, with support of our partners in the Energy Systems Catapult, as well as the National Innovation Center for Data. So we've heard very eloquently this morning why this is a need. What, what is the ambition of, of the MEDA program in both the access and the applications? And, and that's really all around unpicking and addressing this fundamental problem of di digital energy exchange, but data exchange, sorry, between data providers and data users. And how do we, from a visionary perspective, how do we propose we can, we can ha help and, and identify a result resolution to that particular challenge? Well, for us, this is all around creating an energy data service one that will initially enable that transparency, reduce barriers to entry for all, but then also enable increased levels of data access and data exchange. A huge vision, of course, and within Alpha, we've got to distill that into something reasonable and deliverable and tangible. So we've come up with three core work streams. Workstream one, which we called insight and exchange, is all about continuing that customer dialogue, that client dialogue, that end user dialogue, understanding, where the platform needs to be in terms, of, um, in terms of functionality, but also what sort of data would be valuable for third parties to enable their future use cases, their future services and net zero innovations. Um, that will support us in understanding what license frameworks need to be developed and how that needs to um, be, be coordinated with the data providers themselves, because they, they have a, an interest to both open this up, but also to, to manage that data effectively. So we need to, to find a common ground there. Um, but also we, we're keen to very much build on the, the themes of collaboration, which we've heard consistently throughout the morning, um, to ensure that we can work collectively to define common data standards and methods as well, to ensure that this activity isn't done in isolation. This will really help us implement and continue to define what we've called the inside arena. Um, and this is really an area where we're looking to bring together independent organizations uh, and, and thinkers to share their insights into what uh, the solution and service may, may, may look like going forward and how it would add value to them as organizations. Workstream two is realize and test. And, and this is really all about implementing the prototype. Um, and that's not just around standing up uh, the IT and the infrastructure and the functionality of the service. It's also about ensuring that the service is wrapped up with baked in security from day one. So ensuring that the cybersecurity components are addressed from day one is obviously critically important, but also ensuring that we can effectively model and manage that data is also a key consideration. And then finally, Workstream 3, which we called Implement and Grow. Um, this is not just about preparing ourselves potentially for the next stage of the, of the competition, but it's also about understanding how an energy data service could stand on its own two feet going forward. What's the relevant business model? What's the operating and cost base, as well as the value propositions that would need to be elicited to ensure that this was a scalable and sustainable service in its own right? And this will lead us to, um, we've, we've earmarked around 10% of our alpha budget to um, incubate some SMEs, academics, or other industry in interested parties um, to potentially um, you know, call on that funding to develop some ideas and thinking um, around how some of the information that we'll be looking to collect through our data discovery could actually add value to them already. Um, somewhat almost of a mini med apps, if, if you will. Um, and that will be progressing throughout the month of, um, of October. 
So a little bit of a deep dive into the work streams. Um, well, it's very clear to us that there's two core roles and these are not mutually exclusive, of course, but within the sector generally, there's going to be those, the data publishers, those who are providing access to the data. Um, for them, it's not just all about understanding what information is there and how that can support the sector, but also framing how that information can be provided. What's the license? What's the formats? What interfaces will be used to share that information openly through the service? But of course, the data users, whilst, have, whilst they themselves have to be cognizant of the restrictions or the, the controlling factors, the hygiene factors of that data itself, they are really there to understand how the data can be valuable and impactful and relevant to them. So ensuring we can, we can work together to find a common ground between the data publishers and data users is a key question which we're trying to address during Alpha and potentially thereafter. And, and that leads us to, to almost question as well, what level of data is relevant? You know, not just what exists, but how far do we need to go in this search for open data? What's the minimum viable data that we need to be able to provide to enable the, 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 the vast majority of data users to be able to, um, to call upon this information, but also not to overly stress um, the data publishers itself to ensure that the ecosystem can naturally develop um, for, for the, vast, the vast majority of users. And again, collaborations at its very heart. The data discovery piece will call upon data publishers and data providers and we'll be reaching out to, to many ind individuals and organizations over the coming days and weeks uh, to look at how we can get access to some of those data sets. Whilst looking from a glossary perspective, it's really quite important that we start to help define and refine the, uh, the, the, the glossary of, um, of data descriptions um, and identify any potential disagreements or overlaps that may exist within that landscape. And as some of you may or may not be aware, may have been involved in fact, that actually during our um, discovery process, we held a series of different workshops and that enables us to elicit some really rich user feedback. And the user feedback not only allowed us to identify which data was relevant, but also how that data could potentially support you as third parties as data users to drive and, and, and advance the thinking and test solutions uh, and really use this data in anger. So we came up with a series of user stories and then subsequently for Alpha, we've prioritized them into three. Um, these user stories define the situation, the complexity and the potential solutions that may be able to be derived by the data users themselves, but also help define who the potential data providers may be. Uh, I'm not gonna spend much time on these, but there's a link at the end of the slide set where you can go and download all of these slides and, and, and much more in terms of um, our deliverables from the first phase as well, uh, which may be of interest. But in this scenario, um, use case one, user story one, is really all around how an equipment manufacturer who may have um, assets and equipment installed throughout multiple different utilities, so no common access to data sets for their um, field devices, if you like, how they could get access to some condition monitoring data of those deployed assets through multiple clients to help improve and ratify its design. Use case two, um, a very pertinent one when we're looking at that transition to net zero is all about e-mobility. Um, fast charging, as we've already heard from Sophie, fast and rapid charging is going to be absolutely critical as we look to scale these services. So how can access to, um, how can access to network capacity and mobility patterns for the electrical utilities um, and traffic monitoring systems provide increased levels of visibility for the users, but also to um, allow them to take this data to, uh, to, to derive new services and a fast track investment in a critical piece of infrastructure. And then thirdly, um, looking at how a renewable energy service provider or investor may be looking to, in this scenario, introduce an onshore solar farm. Um, but again, would like to understand more about existing constraints on the location, whether that be utility driven in terms of the network capacity, whether it may be metrologically orientated in terms of the potential yield of, of the devices, or even looking down to ONS and environmental information around land restrictions or district council and planning permission uh, data. All very broad, um, but very worthwhile, we hope, um, topics to, to investigate. And whilst we won't necessarily get to, you know, to, 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 these, to the bottom of all of these over the course of, um, of a very tight three month um, alpha, we've, these are, these are the, the frames which we want to progress our thinking in and then collate data from. Workstream two, this is just a very high level overview of our proposed architecture. And you can see they're linking in other meta deliverables in terms of the energy map, the data catalog and the asset register, whilst looking to put in a relatively flexible and extensible uh, set of APIs, which can pull data from multiple different data sources. 
that's going to be key and we've heard that from the numerous different speakers so far this morning but critically we wanted just to focus briefly on our two core value propositions so the energy brokerage um, which is effectively a, a google for energy data looking at how we can frame queries get access and make relationships between data providers and data users Whereas the data collation will be a much more feature rich environment, something which will focus more on the data management, the data modeling, as opposed to just data access. Um, and we'll come on to now, and the broker unequivocally is, is very much our focus with an alpha, just to get some ideas of how that service is starting to shape up. Here you can see a traditional login, uh, login and registration screen. So you'd have to go through the process to ensure that you're an approved uh, user for the platform. Once you've done that and you had a login, you'd be able to then progress into the home screen to be able to frame your query. In this example, perhaps it would be, please tell me more information around the number of primary substations within Newcastle, Leeds, York, London, for example. The system would then come back um, and identify all the various different data providers which it has access to that could provide this information. You can see their URL will be provided. However, that won't happen until the license conditions, which are set by the data providers themselves, are actually acknowledged. This, in many respects, is no different to any of the end user license agreements that we, as individuals who, who use smart devices, will frequently sign up to as we look into download some new software. We would have to read and accept and acknowledge those particular conditions, which should pop up here, um, before then getting access to the URL. So a very early prototype in, in development, but you can see the aspiration of the brokerage service, which will underpin that data collation piece as well. And a little bit on Workstream 3, um, the implement and grow. We are acutely aware that this is an innovation competition, and that is absolutely right, given both the potential scale and scope of this service, but also the maturity of the approach and technology. But post beta, regardless of of, of who and how this is delivered, it's very important to ensure that actually this, the service can be sustainable and scalable in its own right. Therefore, balancing the various different levels of service that you can get from the platform alongside the open, the various um, business models which we'd look to underpin this is really quite important. We don't have all the answers yet. And again, we're looking to canvas you as individuals, as users or providers of data uh, to understand how you feel that these may be most appropriately applied um, within the platform and the service at scale. But you can see it's, it's very much our aspiration to maintain a, a free, of, free of charge basic service in the energy broker, which you've just seen. But as we look forward into more of a feature rich data collation service, which is all around um, data management through, uh, through modeling, the premium subscription or a pay as you go paper access type model may be more appropriate. But we, again, we're looking to test these ideas out through our alpha and thereafter. And a little bit of a call to arms. Um, well, how can you continue to play your part? Access to real data is key for us. And uh, within the user stories, which we framed, um, if you've got information in that sphere, which you would like to share with us, we'd be very much welcome to, to, to hear from you. Um, in terms of the prototype itself, we're really keen to open this up throughout the later stages of our alpha. So in, in kind of October, November time, to open up the prototype to, to small scale user testing, just to start to elicit some of that feedback. Again, if you would be interested in supporting that activity, please don't hesitate to reach out. And then for the third and finally, we mentioned the innovation competition. And again, we've, we've kind of earmarked around 10% of our budget to support that. If you have ideas which should benefit from access to some of the data which you've just out, outlined within the user stories, again, please don't hesitate to get in touch. We'll be using networks throughout both innovation super network and also the energy systems catapult to engage with SMEs, but please don't hesitate to reach out if you feel that you would benefit from a small amount of funding to develop an idea, an idea or a concept. Um, with that, again, just thank you all for your time. Um, websites there with, with a lot of our deliverables on and further information around the use cases, um, as well as um, a, a keep me interested kind of um, registration page as well. So be, by all means, please feel to reach out and my contact details are there. So don't hesitate to get in touch. Thank you all for your time and uh, we look forward to working with you. Thank you very much, Andy. Okay, so we're going to, we've, we're doing really well. Our presenters have uh, shaved quite a bit of time off, so we're catching up. And we're moving on now to a presentation, a double act between uh, Regen and the Energy Systems Catapult, who are gonna talk about some of the work they've been doing to develop uh, their priority use cases that might be useful to you in designing your applications. So I'd like to hand over to Tamar Bourne.
Great, thanks Jenny. So yes, my name's Tamar. Um, I work for Regen, which is a not-for-profit centre of expertise in energy. Um, our focus is on transforming the energy system for, net, for a net zero future. And we've been working with the Catapult and UKRI over the last seven weeks um, to identify problems that people are facing in their local areas um, that energy data um, products and services or applications could help solve. So I'm going to talk through um, our discovery process and our headline findings before handing over to Richard. So the key questions that we wanted to uh, get to the bottom of um, was firstly, who are the potential users? So um, in a local area, who would want uh, to potentially use a data application? Um, what data apps are out there already? So what are people already using? And kind of the key question that we were looking at was what are the problem statements um, and user needs or what we often call use cases that can be addressed through novel data applications. So in order to, to answer those questions, we've kind of gone through a, a three stage process. Um, we started off with a desktop stub study to start mapping out who are those users and stakeholders. Um, we started looking at existing data applications that are already out there. And we also started to identify a range of problem statements that we could then test through stakeholder engagement. So we put out an online questionnaire that was out for about two weeks and had 165 responses. Uh, we ran two workshops with seven, about 70 people participating and we've also conducted several interviews. And then the final output from all of this, which are going to be published at the end of the month, so uh, we're looking at Tuesday or Wednesday next week. Uh, firstly, we'll be summarizing the current uses of local energy data, um, a summary of the engagement findings alongside uh, all the raw data from the survey, if people want, want to dig into that a little bit deeper. Um, but the main output will be a guide to the local energy problem statements. So going back to that first question of who are the potential users, um, this, is, this might win the prize for the most complicated slide, um, but I wanted to put this map up because it does emphasize the fact that all of these different users are interconnected in some way. So um, for example, if you take local authorities in that top left box, not only are they in the public services box, uh, but there's a blue line connecting them to the developers, installers and operators because often local authorities are involved in, in sort of large energy efficiency projects or, or actually developing their own generation projects. And also um, there's, a, there's a pink line going into the consumers box because the public sector are large energy consumers themselves. I'll come back to, to the list of users in a moment. And also we wanted to just check uh, with the survey that we had the right types of organizations. So we asked the, the survey respondents to specify their organization type. And we were quite pleased to see that we hadn't really missed anyone. Um, as you can see, the most people that were interested uh, in, uh, that we had a strong interest from consultancies, community groups, um, and local authorities, but we also had responses from people in the non-energy utility sector, from healthcare providers, built environment, EV, storage providers, etc. So quite a long list of different organizations interested in this space. So the second question that we asked uh, was what data applications are already out there? Uh, we ran quite a, a quick desk-based exercise which identified around 70 data applications and then checked that back with the, with the survey respondents to see if we'd missed any and came out with about 75. Um, we've categorized them here, but we will be publishing a short report which lists them all out so you can see what's there already. Um, but the most uh, sort of the area that's got the most data apps currently um, is around energy network operation. And these tend to be things like capacity maps or uh, innovation outputs. Um, but yeah, as I said, you'll be able to see more in that final output report. And then that third question, um, so what problem statements or what problems are people facing in their local area that, um, that energy data applications could help them solve? And when we were looking for those problem statements, uh, we came up with three criteria to help us narrow, narrow them down a bit. So firstly, they had to address a clear and defined need of one or more stakeholders. They needed to develop benefit to the local energy system and support net zero. And thirdly, they needed to create some kind of economic 
economic um, opportunity from the application of the data. So this is really around making sure that um, the innovations that come forward have a sustainable and viable business model attached to them. So in identifying those problem statements, uh, we started off uh, working with the Catapult to identify uh, what we already knew were, were problems that people might be facing that data might be able to help with. And we categorized those into 11 themes. And then we tested them with the, uh, through the survey, um, which, and also asked people to come up with the ones that we've missed. Uh, which created another 341 ideas, which we then had to go through and think through. Um, and we discussed those all further in, in the workshops that we ran and in the interviews. And then what we've then put into the final report, so we've selected five problem statements per user group and per theme based on the engagement findings. So we've actually put about 70 problem statements in that final report. And I've mentioned the themes before, so the, here are the 11 themes listed out. And I just wanted to refer back to the, the survey, which asked people to specify which areas they were interested in. And achieving net zero and local decarbonisation was the one that pretty much, I think it was 97% of respondents answered all the questions around that area. And it was only large energy users and public health, which received less than 50% than of the interest from the survey respondents. But um, a bit of caution should be um, taken in comparing these different areas because it sort of depended on the people that responded to the survey. So for instance, we had a, a lot fewer large energy users and healthcare providers responding to the survey, but it doesn't mean that the interest isn't there. So this um, is the sort of landing page of, of the final output, which is still being developed at the moment, um, but this is a little preview for you of what you'll find. So th this will be launched next week. So you'll start on this main map, um, which has the list of the 13 users, and it also has a tab there with the 11 themes on. So if you click on, say, um, local authority, uh, either through the map or through the list, it will take you to a local authority summary page. So this summary page has five problem statements. Uh, those are in the green boxes there, um, as well as the, the box in the right-hand corner, uh, bottom corner, which has got some examples of sources of economic value. So thinking about local authorities, um, so obviously their role uh, supports across all, all sec lots of different sectors, sort of including transport, health, economic development. Um, and that's reflected here uh, in, the, in the problem statements that, that they felt were most relevant to them. So often about strategic planning and investment. So for example, I want to develop a detailed evidence-based plan of the activity investments needed to meet net zero in our locality. And then you can see down the middle there, there's a set of icons, um, each linked to a problem statement. And those, those icons reflect the themes that are relevant to that particular problem statement. And if you look at the box on the right hand, the top, the top right hand box, um, so I want to know the most viable places to connect new, genera new generation assets that considers the range of factors, including connection costs and resource availability. So this one came up as quite popular for local authorities because often they want to generate or invest in and generate their own power in order to meet their own net zero targets. So um, that one is obviously linked to energy generation. So if you click on that energy generation theme icon in the middle, it brings up the energy generation page. Um, so here is a very, Similar to the, to the user page, we've got, once again, five uh, problem statements, um, as well as some lists of sources of economic value associated with um, uh, energy generators, so data apps to support generators. And down the center of the page, you've got the icons associated with the potential users. Um, so in this case, we've got both commercial and community developers, obviously the, the local authority that we've already talked about, um, networks, network providers, so the, the top right box, I want to explore options for balancing the variability of renewable generation. So that's obviously relevant to network operators, 
Um, we've also got housing providers there, um, local authorities, as I said, and, and more generally sort of large energy users, um, which links with other users such as um, the non-energy non utilities like the water sector, which have a strong interest in, in energy generation because they have a very large demand themselves and they also have some storage assets. So, um, yeah, and, and the other problems associated with generation here around sort of finding sites and the potential for providing flexibility services and also a few there about how consumers can interact with generation. So that's the sort of whistle stop tour of what is going to appear in the final output, which we'll be publishing next week. Um, they will be available uh, on the Regen website, and I'm sure we will link to them from the UKRI and Catapult websites as well. And as I said, there's going to be around 70 problem statements in there to help you think about uh, new innovative ideas, data applications that can help solve those problems. So I hope that's useful. And do get in touch with me directly if you've got any specific questions. And now I'm gonna hand over to Richard at the Catapult. Thanks, Tamar. Uh, morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Richard Halsey. I'm a director at the Energy Systems Catapult. And as Tamar says, we've been working with Regen and UKRI to think about uh, interesting and innovative potential applications of energy data. Um, contextually, I think uh, it's important to recognise that delivering a net zero energy system is going to require unprecedented levels of change. Um, and, and the impact that we've seen of the, of the world we're living in and the COVID pandemic potentially makes this even more challenging, but also I'd like to think creates some real opportunity for some more data, data and digitally driven solutions to some of the challenges that we face. The, what, one of the key aspects to actually making progress and delivering a, a net zero energy system is the need for us to develop uh, a functioning integrated system of systems and the digitalization of our energy system and the application of more open data is something that the catapult that we see as one of the really key building blocks to achieving this and the work that's been going on in the modernizing energy data access program is one of those key foundational pillars for how we can enable change but obviously the application of that data is is, is ultimately critical we have to be able to apply the data we collect to deliver real benefit and real value uh, and transform our energy system. Now, as, as Tamar set out, the use cases that we've been developing, uh, working with Regen are intended to kind of provide a, a kind of foundational set of information for how we might think about those new applications of data. They, they aren't prescriptive uh, you know, and uh, kind of bounded. They, they're, they're, they're seen very much as a, as a catalyst for the development of ideas through this, this competition that David will talk about a bit more. Um, one of the key things that we see from uh, the, the development of these applications through the competition is their ability to be both scalable and deliver valued outputs and impact across the system uh, as being a key aspect uh, to, the, to the competition and being able to to effectively potentially combine multiple different data sources from, from different sectors, from areas that haven't been connected and integrated before uh, to unlock some of the value of the use cases that Tamar was referring to. Now from the, the, the discovery work in the Local Energy Data Innovation Project, what has emerged from those use cases is three kind of foundational themes uh, for the, the, the application of data, three key areas of, of need and potential value, if you will, um, that, that we think it's, it's potentially important to be, to be thought about and to be explored. So the first one of those is, is planning, forecasting and strategic investment. You know, a key area um, that many of the different use cases kind of touch upon and how can we apply data effectively uh, to, 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 to deliver solutions, to deliver outputs that can support that. Uh, wider system connectivity and operations of the energy system, but also wider systems and their integration, particularly touching on what was being said earlier about transport and other utilities, is another of the key areas that we've seen from, from the work. And finally, the development of, of consumer-facing services, products, um, but also the protection of consumers um, is, is, a, is the final key area that we've seen 
uh, kind of emerge from the use case work. Now, what, what we really, what I suppose, are, are starting to see and what I wanted to, th to think about is how we might apply uh, data in a, in a very different way to deliver benefit and to deliver value aligned to those, those use cases or potentially more widely other use cases. And what, we, what we've been thinking about is, is imagining a world where we can use data in a much more creative, innovative way to deliver value. Uh, and the next few slides I've got is just kind of to outline some thoughts on, on, on what, what a world might be where we are using and applying this data. So really what we want uh, people to do is imagine a world, for example, where we might use data from our homes, buildings, energy networks, in combination to give us deeper insight into the inefficiencies or potentially the hidden values in operations whether that's in homes or buildings that that is then used in combination with advanced simulation artificial intelligence machine learning techniques to develop tailored products and services for homes or for buildings for commercial operators for, for industrial uh, kind of operators and that those tailored packages and services have much greater appeal you know, in our homes, they have much greater appeal to us as, as kind of individual households and consumers, but also they're potentially able to unlock the hidden value that might sit in how we operate and how we do things today. And another example is, 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 a, is, is a world in where we use data in a much more sophisticated and, and uh, integrated way to help us think about the transformation of energy infrastructure, to connect that to how we plan, and forecast uh, the different demands, but also the different configurations of our energy system and how that can align to our net zero ambitions. How that, can, that data and information from that process can unlock investment, how it can help prioritize project development, how it can help engage with different communities and different stakeholders, and collectively then how that can accelerate whole system decarbonization. And finally, potentially the opportunity for us to use data from different sources to, do, to address some of the societal challenges that we have and the challenges we have around uh, delivering warmth for vulnerable consumers, addressing the issues of fuel poverty, how we might be able to connect and combine different data sources to develop solutions that deliver more cost-effective uh, solutions uh, to tackling issues such as fuel poverty. They are just a few examples of some of the thinking that we uh, see. And as Tamar says, the uh, outputs from the discovery phase are going to provide a foundation of different use cases. The only thing, I, again, I would add is that they are seen very much as a catalyst for, for thinking and ideas. They're not deemed to be sort of prescriptive. And hopefully the competition that David will outline uh, later on will provide a, a kind of foundation for a number of different ideas and approaches to how we might apply some of this data uh, effectively to address some of these challenges, but also to create value and opportunity. Uh, thank you, that's all from me. Sorry about that. Thank you very much to Richard and to Tamar. So we are doing great. We're now actually uh, five minutes ahead of schedule. So thank you all very much to all of our presenters. Uh, to the delegates, if you have any questions for any of the speakers that you've heard from this morning, then please do type those into the Q&A box, which is on the menu bar at the bottom of your screen. Gonna have a short break now. It says back at 12, so that gives you an extra five minutes to grab a cup of tea and stretch your legs. But please do take the opportunity to uh, go and network with delegates online. We have, as I say, over 100 people online this morning watching the event. Uh, so please chat, chat away either on, in Zoom here, which is kind of relatively private now, we're not on YouTube, or go to our Meeting Mojo uh, networking platform. I'll leave the link up on the screen during the break so that if you haven't registered already, you can click on that link and register. I just want to share the screen to show you. Um... Ah, Natasha, could you stop sharing a moment so I could share the screen? Thank you. I'm just going to show you the um, Meeting Mojo platform. To find uh, the funders, Bayes, Ofgem and Innovate UK, once you've logged in, click on search at the top of the screen and then you will see these groups here. So if you click on funders, you will see Bayes and Innovate UK, uh, they're in that list there. 
and you can book a meeting with them between two and three o'clock this afternoon by clicking on the book meeting. If it says available, that 10 minutes is available for you to uh, book a meeting with one of our three funders. So please do that as well during the break and we'll see you back here at 12 o'clock. Thank you. Okay, everyone, welcome back. I hope you managed to get a cup of tea and to log on to the networking platform Meeting Mojo. I saw quite a lot of meetings being booked, so that's great. So we're now going to move on to uh, the feature presentation of today's event. We've had some great presentations this morning, setting the scene and providing you with the information to help you to design your application. Um, but now you need to know exactly what it is we're hoping to fund. So I'm going to pass over to my colleague David Richardson to tell you uh, or a bit more about competition scope. Thank you, David. David, you might be on mute. I am. So yeah, everybody who's off making a cup of tea, get back to your computer because we're about to go through the competition scope. So this is important stuff to note down. Um, I'm really excited to, to launch this competition. It's as we've mentioned throughout the morning, it's kind of at the business end of a lot of groundwork that's been going into improving the availability of data across the energy sector and also now really looking at those interactions between other sectors because ultimately achieving net zero is a systemic problem and energy is the bedrock of most sectors as well. So without further ado, we're splitting the modernizing energy data applications competition into two phases. So the, the competition brief for first phase is to be published tomorrow on the 23rd of September. And that will be an application to undertake a three month project in which we were combining the discovery and alpha phases because the regen project is already done. And those projects will run from March to June 2021. Um, we've got £750,000 available for the phase one projects, which means that we're probably looking at up to £150,000 um, per project, although um, value for money considerations are given and you don't have to apply for that full amount. So that leads on that we're, we're likely to fund about six projects under phase one. I'm going to briefly talk about phase two, which is um, the beta phase of the modernizing energy data applications um, competition. And under that phase, we're going to be expecting people to undertake real world trials and develop and launch either a private or public beta. Those nine month projects are going to run from July 2021 to April 2022, that should say. And um, we'll have 1.25 million um, allocated to phase two. In phase two, we're going to whittle down the number of projects. So to be eligible to apply for phase two, you have to have participated and been successful in phase one. And we're going to whittle those 
five or six projects down to three projects to really take through to that full um, beta prototype. So what exactly are we looking for? So projects have to be business led and this is an SBRI competition, which means we'll be providing 100% of funding for the project. And that does mean that you can subcontract specialist skills and expertise from other organizations. And we really do value that input as well. There's a lot of um, really technical knowledge and capability within academic institutions and charities, etc., cetera, um, third parties and NGOs, which um, a business should be taken taken use of. So where where those skills can really add value to the project, we encourage you to partner on a subcontract basis um, within your projects. Um, another point is that projects will be required to participate in a public show and tell at the end of the, the discovery and alpha phases. So we're really taking an open and transparent approach to the development of these projects and um, we're not just looking for the end product to be outstanding, which we are, but we're also looking to um, to disseminate the, the learnings of how to run a project like this and how to integrate energy data with data from other sectors so that others can follow on and really build some great applications as well. So I'm now going to quickly run through some of the really important headline parts of what we're looking for from your projects. Um, I do encourage you all to go through the competition brief as well, which goes into far more detail and has a number of questions which you'll have to respond to within your application. But these are some of the headline things that you really will have to look for. So as I've already mentioned, data from the energy sector must be integrated with data sources from at least one other sector. Um, and that could be a whole range of things. It could be from construction, it could be from transport, um, it could be from kind of satellite and GIS mapping services. Uh, it could even be information from the social sector on vulnerable consumers, et cetera. So we're giving you freedom with that, but as I've already mentioned, we're really trying to expand the, the range of applications and products which are being developed so that they really treat uh, achieving decarbonization at, at an affordable cost as being a systemic issue which cuts across multiple sectors. That's really one of our important objectives of this competition is to show that that approach can um, reap benefits not just in terms of business growth but also the societal benefits that can come out of it. We do expect you to use state-of-the-art techniques, whether that's across um, computer science and machine learning, artificial intelligence, and statistical mathematics, or whatever ra other range of digital techniques that you're interested in. We will be holding an interview phase for this competition. So after the written application, um, a short list will be invited to interview. And we do have an expert panel there um, from a range of organizations um, like the Turin Institute and some industrial players um, who are really going to push you to, to investigate why you're choosing to use the techniques that you are. So it's not buzzword bingo. <laughs> Don't just chuck in, um, we're going to revolutionize the world using AI unless you really can answer questions about why you've chosen those techniques, how you're going to implement them, and to show that you have the capability within your team to do so as well. Good design principles is really central to what we're trying to do here. So combining those really state-of-the-art data techniques, um, utilizing the data architecture through the modernizing the energy data access competition as well as the emerging open data in other sectors is really important but we also need to couple that with undertaking um, really rigorous user research so your product should be developed on the user needs of actual people those who are going to be using your service 
Um, you've got to implement best practice in terms of design principles, how you work together. We're expecting you to use agile working practices and really to be innovative in how you work together, particularly now that it's likely um, a good chunk of this competition might be delivered and engaged with your stakeholders virtually. And throughout the projects, you should be undertaking user experience testing and really ensuring that through iteration, you deliver an excellent user experience for whoever your customers are going to be. You will be asked about how you're taking an open, diverse and inclusive approach. Um, similar to the comments that I just made is we're designing these services for people ultimately. And we need to ensure that they meet the needs of all areas of society. So um, we're not stipulating exactly how you achieve this. It might be through the diversity of your own team. It might be about how you engage with groups which tend to be disengaged with um, the climate change discourse uh, or their own energy usage. So really ask yourself some of these questions. Um, there's a video that went up on the BBC just the other day about how climate activism really needed to broaden its engagement base, which is slightly different than what we're working on, but um, I thought it was a really a powerful video, so check it out. Some of the questions that you could ask yourself is how will you consider and design for people with accessibility requirements and ensure that you're not um, excluding anyone from using your data product or service? How can you mitigate your own unconscious biases as a team? How you'll engage disadvantaged and disengaged groups? Um, encourage diversity of thought and people who just take a different perspective on the work that you're doing? And how will you test that your solution actually promotes greater equality of outcomes ultimately through your user experience testing? So your project must solve a real world issue in a local energy system of the UK. So we're not saying that you have to stipulate um, a specific local energy system, but you have to demonstrate that that is a problem that exists and the user needs um, is there within the UK. And on a local basis, really, there is a local theme to this competition. How do we um, encourage distributed energy resources? How do we take into account the, the diverse needs of people in different areas of the UK? And how do we build business growth, which benefits the local area as well? So the local energy data innovation project, which Regen have carried out has been really useful for this because they, they will be publishing research, which um, has already captured a range of user needs that are real world that you can start to identify who your customer base might be and really give you a jump start on identifying those problems that you can build against. Another point is that we want you to focus on building a credible business case. So too often do we see solutions which seem really snazzy, they have a good narrative and you can kind of understand the justification for them, but they leave it too late to start developing the business case. So if you develop a really great application, but ultimately it doesn't have a positive business case and you haven't thought about the route to commercialization from the outset, then it doesn't get used and it doesn't get scaled in any meaningful way. So there's really got to be a focus on that from the start, um, how you'll start to build that business case through your, your discovery in alpha and then put it into something which is really concrete and tangible during your beta um, and which will hopefully help you attract investment as well. Your projects will all be required to champion open source approaches. So there's various ways that you can do that. I'd encourage you to browse online about different models of open source data um, services. So that might be taking a licensed approach. It might be by fully publishing your source code. It might be um, a, a whole range of different things. So some models, they allow you to have a free service to an extent and then paid for add-ons. But we're really trying to champion this open source approach, which allows other people to um, 
combine their forces and really develop things a sector which will change the UK energy system. Um, one of the key recommendations of the energy data task force was about taking a presumed open data approach. Um, we've endorsed the recommendations of the energy data task force along with Bayes and Ofgem and we're really looking to um, to walk the walk by showing that our own projects are taking that approach. So that doesn't mean that you have to publish all the data that's produced and created during your project, but it does mean taking a triage process and presuming from the outset that you will publish data. And if there's commercial or privacy issues, et cetera, that are identified through the triage process, then that could be justification for not doing so. So I'd encourage you to have a look at some of the work that the energy systems catapult and some of the distribution networks as well are taking to develop um, processes for, for presumed open approaches. Um, and finally, as I've already said, we're trying to champion progress towards fulfilling the recommendations of the energy data task force, which includes a presumed open data strategy. Um, but there's also other elements of it, such as improving the visibility of resources on the system, um, moving towards the development of a digital system map, supporting uh, digitalization of services and greater data access. And now, as Dinka and Stephen identified earlier on today, there's new initiatives which are really building on that. So it's important for you to demonstrate during your application that you're aware of the various initiatives which are linked um, and being coordinated across the energy sector so that we have a common road that we're, that we're working together to, um, to move down. So that's all from me. There'll be more information in the competition brief as I've said but those are the really headline areas that we want you to focus on. So really we're looking at how we solve real world issues in our local areas that you can show that there's a, a drive and demand for and a route to commercialization. We're looking for you to harness energy data using the modernizing energy data access work that's already been carried out and combine that with data from other sectors to really drive this cross-sectoral approach where we um, take into consideration the interactions between various different infrastructures and people um, for achieving net zero. So that's all from me. I'll hand over to Jenny and I believe Carl is next to go over the eligibility and competition. Yes, thank you David, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> A nifty so, bit there. <laughs> We will now move on to Carl Wilkins from Innovate UK. He's going to talk to you about the kind of rules and, and how you go about actually doing the application on the IFS system. So over to you, Carl. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, as Jenny said, I'm Carl Wilkins, the Portfolio Manager for Innovate UK in this competition. Uh, I'm going to go through the agenda quickly with you. So part one will be going through the scope and eligibility criteria for the competition. Uh, part two discusses the innovation funding service, application finances and any partner and also submitting your applications, assessment, project setup, and the successful applicants' next steps. Okay, eligibility criteria. Resubmissions are allowed for this competition. Just for your understanding, a resubmission is an application Innovate UK judges as not materially different from one that you've submitted before, but it can be updated based on the assessor's feedback. And there's also the definition of what's not a resubmission, therefore you review it as well. Eligibility criteria. Um, David's already covered most of this, as you say, but projects can be up to a maximum of 150,000 in costs and last up to three months in length. Um, to lead a project, you must be a UK based business and single applicant only. Uh, for other Innovate UK projects, if you have an outstanding final claim or an independent accounts report on a live UK project at the moment, you will be eligible to apply for grant funding for this competition as a lead. If you apply to a previous competition as a lead or a sole company, and awarded funding by Innovate UK, but did not make a substantial effort to exploit the award, we will award no more funding to you at this point. Okay, so these are some of the key dates here. So the competition opened at the 12th of October, briefing event today, of course, and the submission deadline of the 18th of November. Interviews, as David said, will take place between the 11th and 13th of January, and the information will be provided to you in notifications on the 22nd of January, 2021. Innovation Funding Service. 
Um, the, the publication hasn't been made yet, so this will be published tomorrow, hopefully, and we'll be able to give you more signposting as to where you can find the information on IFS. To create an account, um, in order to apply for a competition, the lead applicant will need to create the account first. If you've applied for previous competitions in IFS, you can simply sign in as you would have done before. You can use Companies House to look up or search for your organisation to save typing in the name and address. If you're not on Companies House, you can manually enter this information. We advise that research organisations, academic events, uh, enter information that so you're not listed as a business. Um, this is open for businesses only, so will not be applicable. Um, please ensure that you enter this information as correctly as you can when first logging in, as this can cause problem later in the line. Uh, project details. Um, there are a few sections to go over when you first submit an application. The project details is the first section that you will see. Um, under project summary, you will need to highlight the need to challenge or approach an innovation that, with the key outcomes. It's key to setting the scene for the assessors and it gives them an overview of the vision that you have for your project. In the public description, this is where you will add a description of your project and this will be published if your project is successful. So be aware of confidentiality here as well. And under scope, it's important that your project is within scope to receive funding. Please use this field to justify how your project fits the scope for the assessors. If you're unsure as to whether your project is eligible or not, or will fit the scope, please contact our customer support team and I will share those details with you later on. Okay, the application questions. Um, these are subject to change as we're not currently published, but there are, will be 10 questions as standard. Um, and there are some appendices that you will need to complete as well. Um, you'll be able to find more information on the how to apply tab within IFS. Okay, application finances. Okay, to claim funding, um, your business does not have to be registered UK, registered with a company's house when you apply, but it must be registered before you can actually receive the funding. Uh, you are unable to claim funding if you're an overseas organisation and your company begins with FC. Your organisation helps to set up as a branch of your company, which begins with BR, or your company is based in Jersey and your begins with JE. Okay. Labour costs, um, this is where you enter the role within the project, uh, any gross annual salary, the number of staff that you have and the day spent on the project, it will then automatically calculate the total cost for you. If you have multiple people in the same role on the same average salary, then enter this within the role within project field and this should update it for you. If you have an employer that's part time, you should enter their cost as a full time equivalent. You can also adjust working days. Um, per year from this as a default, um, if it's different for your particular project. Please note that dividends, bonuses and non-productive time cannot be included within the labour costs as they are ineligible. When making grant claims against labour costs, actual costs must be supported with timesheets where necessary. Okay, overheads, we define overheads such as additional costs and operational expenses incurred directly as a result of the project. These could include additional costs for administrative staff, general IT, rent and at utilities where applicable. You can select from the three options you can see on the screen for how you would like your overheads to be calculated. We class indirect or administration overheads as costs associated with back office functions such as the finance or HR roles within or whose primary function is to support the running of the business standard. They only claim a portion of their time and their work needs to be additional to the delivery of the project. Typically these costs are not directly related to a particular product or a service production. Direct overheads are costs associated with staff working directly on the project uh, for costs incurred such as you know, laptops, desks and other office facilities. We provide a simple form which needs to list each type of direct overhead together with the methodology for this particular project. Again, these overheads would not be incurred if the project does not happen. Uh, material costs, you'll need to enter and describe what material costs you intend to use as part of the project. The volume and the cost will also need to be entered and the materials listed must be project specific. Uh, please provide as much information as you possibly can. Um, for example, in the past we've had people state 50,000 for consumables, which is not enough information and you will receive a call from our project finance team if you're successful to ask for more information at this point. Any items which you would usually depreciate as per your company's policy should also be listed in uh, capital usage. Uh, materials supplied by associated companies or subcontracted from other members must be listed as cost, excluding any profit elements or margins. Uh, here you'll also see how to describe it using the equipment. You'll have to put in confirmation of whether it's a new uh, state of equipment or existing. Um, if it's new, the purchase cost will be needed and how long uh, it's been depreciating for over a matter of time. Uh, these calculations will need to be in line with your standard accounting practices. Okay, subcontractor, um, 
if there's going to be a significant cost for subcontractors and you'll need to justify this um, and also who the contractor is going to be, why you're using them and what you need them for specifically. It will both need to be stated here and also within your application. Uh, it's important that you justify the use of subcontractors within the application, especially if they're non-UK based as the assessors do not see this level of financial detail. Therefore, they would need to know where the costs are coming from. Okay, travel and subsistence. Uh, here you would include things such as any essential meetings or any travel that you need to include. Um, you cannot include any sales or marketing activity as this is ineligible. Travel costs must be incurred at economy travel only. Uh, you should be prepared to provide a breakdown of these costs if the project finance reviewer asks for more detail. For example, it, they may require you to split out the cost for subsistence, accommodation and travel components where necessary. Other costs, um, it's best to check the finance guide for this to see if there's any other costs that can be included here. Uh, if you're unsure, please don't hesitate to contact the customer support team for more information. Uh, any other costs which don't fit into the previous categories, for example, could be any training costs, licensing for new technology or patents. Um, please ensure there's no double uh, cost being counted here and all costs are justified as before. Okay, submitting your applications. Um, this is a summary of the project costs available and it's also what the assessors will see at coming to the assessment points. Uh, if you need to edit your application for any reason once it's already been submitted then this is definitely possible. Uh, first you'll need to reopen the application so you'll go into your IFS dashboard where you'll see the option to reopen as shown in the slide. The option is reopen which is also visible at the application status page. Once reopened you can make any change to your application that you need but when you're finished please remember to resubmit it otherwise it will not be counted. You need to click on the green review button and submit and then once again on the final submit button. Uh, please, please submit your applications early. We can track um, site usage and submission uploads. Uh, and this table shows a breakdown of how uh, the applications are submitted and how close to the deadline that they are actually submitted here. The deadline to mention is 11 a.m. on the deadline date as previously stated. Anything after that time at 11.01 will not be counted. So please do get your applications in early, um, especially if you have any technical queries, please contact our customer support team in plenty of time before the deadline so that they can assist you and ensure that your application is made. Okay, on to assessment. So all eligible applications will be assessed. This will involve a scope check and then review by up to five independent assessors. Um, feedback will be collated into final scores and then they're following this, so there will be interviews for the uh, people that will be taken to the next stage. Assessors tell us what they want in terms of clarification, uh, detail and justification, and just to see how applicants have presented a viable opportunity for growth, and also with exciting and innovating opportunities for funding. Also, that they have the right people um, and we also have the right approach in terms of running a successful application and can exploit the results successfully. Okay. Uh, answer the questions in the guidance so the assessor can award you the maximum marks. Um, even if you have a fantastic idea, if you've not answered them correctly or at length, um, your application won't score well, unfortunately. Make sure your application also reads well. Uh, we just want to keep the assessors engaged and interested as they could be reading a number of proposals. Um, if they're reading a lot of applications, try to make yours stand out where possible. Uh, some notes on feedback. Uh, the feedback is compiled using the written comments of the independent assessors who review and assess the applications. It is intended to be constructive by nature uh, and also to highlight any strong or any weak areas of application. So please don't take it to heart. Please bear in mind that the applications are assessed by a number of assessors so you may receive information which appears to be conflicting to some others. This may reflect in their different interpretations of the proposal that's submitted and also in their comments. It must also be noted that some proposals may appear to be of informally assessed, uh, favorably assessed based on the comments in such instances. It could be that your proposal simply fell below the funding threshold uh, where others may have achieved a higher merit in terms of score. In terms of scoring, we review scores and feedback to check the assessors are adhering to our guidelines and scoring fairly for each application. In some cases, if we feel the score isn't just or the feedback isn't consistent, we may remove that score as an outlier and then update the total score at the end for the final application total. Please be aware that the both low and high outliers may be removed and as a result, scores may increase or decrease. If outliers are removed, it's not something that we're able to reflect, unfortunately, in the final scores, um, but you will receive written feedback which will confirm any inconsistencies in comments. Application assessments. Uh, this is an excerpt from a panel sheet. Um, this sheet is created after the assessments have taken place to collect the information. The left hand column that you can see shows the score average for a particular application and the, the highlighted section there, the score spread. 
this is to show the difference between the top and bottom scores where we would identify outliers. Uh, in the next two columns, you'll also see the count of the numbers of no to any applications not being in scope or no if they're in terms of not recommending proceeding with this particular application. Uh, if there are three or more in either of those columns, we will review the application detail scores and also the feedback to check that accurate. And then we can look at the outliers from that point to see if they need to be removed or not. So identifying outliers. The purple box highlighted there, um, this will show you the particular set of scores for a question and the green box that we've highlighted going along there, this is for one particular assessor and how they've scored a particular application. Um, we take a look for a difference for around 20 or more on the right hand side under the total and to identify any outliers. At first glimpse, you can consider assessor three to be the outlier with a score of 62, but this must be backed up by their feedback, which we will review separately. For assessor feedback, the lead will be notified when your feedback is available. This information will be sent to IFS and you'll receive an email to confirm where you can access the feedback and review it in full. Uh, for the interview stage, um, this may have been discussed earlier, just to confirm, so you can bring up to five people to attend the interview. You'll have 10 minutes to provide a presentation and there will also be a show and tell element advice as well at the end. There will be a 20 minute Q&A session led by members of the panel. You will have the opportunity to respond to assessor feedback so the panel can read it prior to the interview and the response to feedback, presentations and presenters will also be provided ahead of the interview as well. Okay, project setup. So these are the project setup stages that need to be completed by all lead, uh, lead applicants within 30 days. You need to start project setup as soon as you've been notified if you are successful and projects should start within 90 days from that point. Uh, all grant claiming project partners, or in this case leads, will be required to complete project setup. And to avoid delays, you should also consider the below. So who will be the project manager, the finance contact, and if there's anyone else you need to include, they can also be invited on IFS. Okay. All grants are claimed quarterly in arrears. And we no longer offer a conditional offer letter after notifications to organisations are sent afterwards because you're signing up to the terms and conditions for Innovate UK initially. Um, so we will assign monitoring officers who will be your main point of contact throughout and uh, they will also review the finances and check this information for you as well. If you're successful when you start your project with grant funding you need to be aware that we will pay your claims in quarterly in arrears so if you are a smaller business or an organisation you need to manage your cash flow accordingly. This can catch small companies out so please make sure they, uh, any costs that are incurred up front will be included within your particular project costs. The pattern of claims can impact on cash flow. As I said, it's quarterly in arrears. And finally, this is just a slide to show any contact um, support that you may need. So that's the customer service team that I've previously alluded to, their contact number there and their emails. And their emails will be generated and also sent on to uh, competing members, myself and David included, will also be able to help with queries where needed. Also have the KTN that and Innovate UK as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carl. Okay, so we're going to start our Q&A session now. So if I could ask all the speakers to put their videos and their microphones on, and we'll uh, chug through the questions that we've had come in from, for all of our presentations this morning. So um, starting with uh, the first ones that were related to the policy and regulation presentations that we saw, there was one for Dinka and for Stephen that were very similar questions around your strategic plan on what and when data will, is hope, you hope will be available through these systems. So do you want to, uh, should we start with Dinka first? Sure, yeah, I can take that. So, um, so I guess, uh, there's a lot that is already happening. Uh, I expect that the best view of that would either be in the digitalization strategies that the network companies will publish. I'm assuming when you say core of the system, you mean networks, but if not, please clarify what, what do you mean by the core of the system? Uh, but if it is the networks, then uh, they will publish their implementation timeline and roadmap for how they're going to make more and more data available um, with with timelines and, and milestones. So watch out for the action plans, which we hope will come out end of this year. Um, but I also recognize that there is a need for from our stakeholders 
for government and Ofsham to also um, clarify everything that has happened so far in terms of more open data. So um, there is obviously the energy data best practice work. Um, there is uh, code modifications that have happened, which are making more and more data available. And our intention is to enough to package all of that into some sort of policy document, which makes it clear to everyone of what improvement in uh, data availability and data visibility has happened since the publication of the task force report. Uh, I mean, publications from government have been severely delayed, so I don't want to commit to a, a date, but I, I hope that any such energy data strategy is published sometime end of this year, early next year, which explains all of this. But please don't wait for that publication uh, because I'm sure there will be lots of announcements that will keep happening, which explain everything that has improved. And the modernizing energy data.gov.uk page that is also on one of the slides that I presented will also give you an update on everything that has happened uh, since the publication of the task force report. So hopefully that answers your question, but please ask if you want to clarify. Thank you. Thank you, Dinka. And Stephen, do you have anything to add from off Jim's point of view? Uh, only a couple of bits to add. I think has done a good round tour. Yeah, the digitalization strategies and action plans, I think, are a really good focal point for the network companies. Uh, there's other nice examples which I point you to. Um, so, for uh, uh, Alexon is in the in the latter stages of its code mod P398 for the BSC. That's the balancing and settlement code, uh, where they are explicitly going through the process with their self-regulation of, of treating BSC data as presumed open which will obviously be a, a, an open door then to gain the access to the information that you're seeking. Um, I'm sure the other code bodies, administrators and such are enthusiastic for their data to be. So I, I think they, when you refer to the core of the, the energy system, those really are the two main groups I would point to. And, and I think, I think if, yeah, I suppose my, my general point would be that if people feel like that they are blocked, that they've got legitimate, reasonable use cases, then that's always an interesting conversation and we can work out if there's any, if it's reasonable and if there's practical things that we can do to support that because uh, everyone's going through a lot of change and the only way we'll solve it is through communication and I'm sure uh, that really does apply to the specific data sets everyone's looking for access to. Yeah, that's great, thank you. And next question is for Sophie. So to compel existing EV charging infrastructure providers to open their data to market, do you think that there will be a need for licensing or regulation? Um, so I'm about to start the most civil servant uh, response ever, but at the moment we, so with our consultation that we're planning to launch in uh, late autumn, um, we're going to be exploring that. So all of all options are on the table and we haven't really settled on one, but we're using the powers in the, um, what was it? The AEV Act, the Automated Electric Vehicles Act. Um, we'll be looking at sort of what powers we want to use um, and sort of, or maybe not. So, you know, do we need to license? Maybe not, but sort of otherwise, you know, it's, it's literally all on the table at the moment. So there really hasn't been a decision made as to what, um, what route we're going to take. Okay, thank you very much, Sophie. Um, and our next question was um, back to Gavin, actually no, to, yeah, to Gavin uh, from Icebreaker One. So uh, how does your Icebreaker One fit with or complement the PASS 1878? Sure. So it's a really good question because it helps to delineate what we're working on and what we're not working on. So what we're not trying to do is create any new ontologies or new metadata standards in this. We're trying to work out what are the ones that are working for around particular use cases and then put in place the governance process. And that actually links back to the conversation about licensing as well of how can we connect the organizations so that they have um, the ability to share information within a, a, a controlled environment um, and then the, the specifics of how uh, we apply a particular standards, whether it's about appliances or whether it's about a, another part of the national grid, it's very much the industry to come together and uh, links to another question as well about making sure we've got many voices in the room to say, well, is this functional for the end applications that uh, people are building in these competitions? Or are there other things that need to happen in the rest of that data supply chain? So we're trying to analyze this more from a data supply chain point. If you'd say, who are the suppliers? 
who are the end users, who, what apps need to be built, and then apply the whatever existing standards within that framework. That's great. Thank you very much, Gavin. Um, I'm going to move on to some of the competition questions now, just in interest of time. So we had a question from uh, Chris Dunham. Does the product or application have to lead to a direct commercial gain to the companies involved? So leading to IP, et cetera. So David, do you want to take that question? Yeah, so the project has to create business opportunities, which doesn't necessarily have to be directly within the companies that are delivering the project, but it does have to have a strong um, justification of how business opportunities will be created from the solution, even if it's for a third party who might, for instance, be using the product or service that you develop. Thank you very much. And our next question um, is from Alan McMoran. Does the panel recognise they've potentially excluded a large number of entrants by pushing for open source? It's very difficult to create a viable business model on open source. So uh, any comments on that? So, um, yeah, so it's, it, it's more about the interpretation of open source, really. And I think we're using quite a... Uh, a liberal de definition of that but what we're really trying to avoid is the development of applications which are then going to create lock-in or a legacy system which in 10 or 15 years is dependent on a single point of failure so and um, as i said earlier there's various different licensing models for open source um, approaches it might be that the core part of your service is a commercial one but you're either using open source tools to build upon or open source standards. Um, I might let Gavin make some comments on what has happened in open banking, but for instance, Google use a pretty fundamentally open source approach and they've created quite a good commercial model off the back of it. Yeah, shall I come in there as well? Yes, please okay. do. That. So, so I'm very happy to expand on this. It's a much bigger question. I think one of the things to really focus in on in the business models here is what type of value are we creating? Uh, within open banking, uh, the individual bank statements of a company, well, the data there is owned by the company or owned by the individual because of GDPR. Um, and, and what the mechanism there say, it mandates is open APIs across the entire ecosystem, but the same open API across the whole system. So there's common interoperability and actually reduce the cost, increases efficiency across the market. There's then a two tier structure where when everyone's sharing data and there's broadly reciprocity across that system with this fair value exchange, people don't have to pay for the data exchange. It's treated as marginal cost. When people have an imbalance there, there's a premium API where people can charge for data. So I think here, if we're thinking about ch charging for data as a service, we're not saying don't make money. That's, it's quite important to make money because that's how you keep the lights on. Um, but there are different licensing models within that. Now, you can take a view to say, well, we'll make the entire uh, code base open source. And with open banking, that is the case. Uh, the the under underpinning directory and all the work that we're going to be doing in Icebreaker will be open source. Whether or not you need to do that to enable... Um, your end application, well, what are you competing on? That's the, the big question. Are you competing on the quality of the service and on an ongoing basis, or are you competing on being a, a better software developer than somebody else? So I think there's lots of nuanced questions in there, uh, but I think in terms of developing the business model, the thing that I'd really point people to explore is how do you charge for whatever you're doing as a service? You can protect components of your intellectual property around that in lots of different ways, from patents to service design and so on. But we're trying to minimize here the friction in the system. So data increases in value, the more it's connected. So how do we maximize the number of connections to the data flows that you've got? Lovely. Thank you, Gavin. Okay, so moving on, a uh, question from Adam Bond. Um, can academics and universities lead a bid or can they only be subcontractors? Um, no, we're asking for businesses to lead the bid, um, but encouraging capability from academics or universities to act as subcontractors. Or, of course, you could set up a company, which is actually quite straightforward and quick to do, um, to help us promote spin apps from academic institutions as well. Lovely. Um, another one for you, David. Does the cross sector criteria include energy sectors? So, would a project looking at Gas, electricity, 
electricity trade-off quality uh, be in scope or would it need to include a non-energy sector? Um, yeah, it would need to include a non-energy sector, but uh, again, we're, it's probably not something that we're going to mark you out of scope for, but you will need to provide justification if you reach interview panel of how it's distinct from the energy sector. So for instance, let's say you were using some um, information from the land registry, which is just about where um, energy infrastructure might lie or how it might interact with other things that would qualify Lovely. and the next one is from victor selwood uh, this is for carl does it say that projects must be 30 days duration or less no the, the project phase for phase one should be three months or up to three months great thank you and from an anonymous attendee uh, is there any limit on the number of applications that can be made uh, by the lead applicant can they put in more than one project idea more than one project application maybe one for carl standard yes. eligibility requirements i think yeah so standard would be that you can be involved in up to three applications at the very most in all in all areas effectively yeah that sounds like a reasonable number and and as a subcontractor uh, a subcontract, there wouldn't be any limit, um, as far as I'm aware, from previous competitions, so we could continue as that. Lovely. Great. That's, that's great. So going back to um, a couple of the earlier ones that I missed, uh, Gavin, you may have covered this already because you talked about the banking, but given your experience in the banking market and your engagement with the energy market, how long do you think it will take us to start seeing a tangible change in an open energy data ecosystem? So, so the, good, the good news is we've got lots of learnings uh, on open banking. It's taken them at least four years to go from putting together a working group to writing a standard, to getting it regulated, to getting it in the marketplace. Uh, and it did take a regulatory push in there as well. So that's important. Involving the regulators is really important in this. The good news is we, we've got that as a blueprint, but it, you know, it is a blueprint. The, the challenge here is not a technological one from my perspective. It, it's, it's a cultural one. It's like how can we get everybody to lean in to say, oh, let's really explore quickly here. And, and this competition really is driving that message home. It's like, we're, we're trying to build the, if you like the back end of this with, with uh, Open Energy and, and Siemens have got their uh, offering um, as well as stimulate the app ecosystem. It has taken uh, Open Banking, you know, I'd say four years to get to the point where they've got an app store now uh, in development. And I think it will take a similar amount of time, not because we can't build it faster, but just to kind of get all the machinery working and getting uh, people together. Being able to create demonstrators, we'll be able to do this year and next year. Uh, getting it to scale, I think it'll, t it'll take a little while, but again, the regulator has a potential role to play here in helping to nudge people forward. Thank you very much. And um, moving on to the next question, which you, you've set up for me beautifully, Gavin. So Catherine asked, um, how do you continue to build partnerships between industry policymakers and energy consumers? Uh, it's been, amazing today with this many people online but how do uh, through collaboration but how do you break down those barriers to to find each other so i would say from a ktm point of view catherine register for that networking platform if you haven't already because i would just by looking at the numbers i would think most of the delegates are on there now um if you have any um, trouble you don't find the skill that you need on there then please come and get in touch with myself and um, I'm working alongside our digital team so we'll be able to find a, a partner for you that way um, and all the information from today so all of our presenters are providing their contact details so that if you want to get in touch with them to be able to ask more questions you will be able to do that after the event so hopefully that's answered your question so I think there's two more to go um oh no that's it sorry sorry it jumped about a bit so that are, that's all our questions does anybody else uh well from our att attendees have any last questions they would like to ask before we move on to the final presentation there, there was just one other question jenny which was dismissed about um how projects should interact with the the meta projects which um, are still ongoing so I, I think that is that's a fair question and essentially what we're asking you to do is be 
cognizant and aligned to the initiatives that are ongoing in the energy sector. So we're, we're trying to do this at pace, which as you've seen today means that there's quite a lot of moving parts. It's something that frequently government is criticized for moving too slowly. And so we're trying to coordinate a number of different initiatives from the task force to the meta projects, to the development of applications, digitalization strategies, the, the data strategy Dinka talked about. So what we're really asking you to do is to be aware of those initiatives, to know what route they're going down so that you can be aligned with that and be able to utilize the common data architecture and services that do come out of the meta projects. And actually, by the time your projects are entering the second phase, if you are successful, then the meta projects will have completed their beta. So I think the timing is quite good to allow your discovery in alpha to really engage meaningfully with those projects and then to be able to utilize the solution during the second phase. Thank you very much, David. Well, it looks like all of our questions have now been uh, answered. So thank you to everyone online for posting those questions. There will be uh, a chance for you to get in touch if you have any further questions. Uh, but thank you all to, to all of our speakers for now. You can go back on to mute. And we'll move on to the last presentation of today, which is by me, just to uh, very quickly share some of the support that is available from the KTN to help you with this competition. Someone I can find the button, there it is. So first of all, to say, if you're not aware of the KTN, um, we exist to connect innovators um, with new partners and new opportunities to develop and deploy innovation for the benefit of UK PLC. We have an organisation with deep expertise in different uh, economic sectors. Myself, I lead on thermal energy systems, so anything to do with heating and cooling is my area of expertise. And as I said, for this particular competition, I'm also working closely with our digital team that represents software developers, uh, data visualization, that type of thing. So together, we also have a great uh, cross-sectoral reach as well. And we're hoping by bringing together these diverse connections that will make a positive change uh, for the UK economy. So, as you can see here, the first thing we can help you to do is to find partners, or in this case, as it's an SBRI, to find subcontractors. Um, we have our networking platform set up for this competition. It's open today for you to do one-to-one -one discussions with Bayes, Innovate UK uh, and Ofgem, but you'll be able, this will stay open until the competition closes. So you will still be able to message different people on there if you're looking for a particular skill, um, then you'll be able to search on there to find that skill and message them to start a conversation offline. Um, please do complete your profile in there because when you first register, it only asks you for a small amount of information. Once you've registered and you've logged in, Go click on your name at the top of the screen and it will allow you to edit your profile uh, and give a lot more information about skills and expertise that you have that might be useful to someone who's looking for project partners. Uh, it will also allow you to search. So we've taken the category that you said your, your organization was most closely aligned with, whether it's energy or software development or data visualization, there is, you can actually search on that to help you find a particular uh, skill set that you might need. If having looked through the networking platform, you can't find the skill you need, then you can come to me for a one-to-one -one partnering service. So um, my email's on the next slide, but you'll be able to email me. We can have a chat about what it is you want to do, and then we'll try and match you up with someone that uh, we know is interested in this competition or beyond our wider network as well. The um, proposal advice is something else we can do for you. So in terms of initial chats, you can talk to myself on my email there, but you can also contact the competition helpline. So this is Innovate UK's helpline that uh, Carl mentioned in his slides. You can get in touch with them either by email or by the telephone 
to it's probably a good idea to contact them if you want to just check your uh, eligibility in terms of your the scope of the competition so if you've got an idea and you want to make sure that you are going to be in scope then uh, drop them a note and they will help you confirm that or, or give you some pointers. Once you've written your application, um, we offer a free proposal review service. So before you submit it on IFS, you can download your application, send it to us, and we'll review it and give some constructive comments on how you could strengthen um, your application. Uh, maybe there's bits you've missed and one question is slightly weaker than another and we might be able to uh, bring up your overall score to allow you to be successfully funded. No guarantees obviously because it depends uh, which particular ideas the assessors think are worth funding but we will help you hopefully to uh, submit a really good strong application. So that's the help that the KTN can offer you. And that is now the end of today's event. Um, we hope that you found all of that information useful. We're very, very sorry again for the technical problems that we had at the start of today, but I'm glad that we are finishing on time. Um, as I said earlier, the recording of today's event through Zoom will be sent to you along with um, a link to all the presentations. So you'll have all the contact information that you've seen during today's presentations. If you have booked to do a one-to-one -one with uh, Bayes, Innovate K or Ofgem, we'll be moving over to the networking platform uh, at two o'clock um, and to access those meetings, you go to your schedule and click on the meeting at that when the time is right. So when it gets to the time of the meeting, click on that link, it opens up another window and you have a video chat with the person you've booked your one-to-one -one with. So other than that, uh, I wish you the best of luck with today's competition uh, and please do get in touch if you need any help. Thank you very much.